If I could just address first the, the comment you made about, uh, Your Honor, about domestic cases and about people who have the jobs that involve collaboration and talking to families and counseling them. Family law, it seems to me, um, is one of the areas that's so hard hit by the budget cuts, and those are the first jobs to go. So <clears throat> because there are too few judges in family law, because those kinds of people are the first to go with the budget cuts, those kinds of services, I'm afraid, may not be available anymore, even though they are so valued and so important. So I just Which want would then um, justify or maybe give uh, greater credence to this collaborative law um, approach where they're not in the court system. They're, they're dealing outside of the court system and solving their own problems. Um, for, you know, the reason the concept materialized is to avoid the tension and the negativity that you find when you enter into the court system for a dissolution of a marital relationship. But if you're saying that California especially is experiencing a, a diminution of uh, availability of court personnel, it would stand to reason that uh, these alternative uh, means of dealing with a dissolution of a family uh, would maybe get greater traction. And can that be a model then for some of the other uh, disputes that, that present themselves to courts and find that they're not getting the attention uh, that they need? Yeah, although I think once again the problem will be money. Um, who pays for that? And, and so, um, but I agree with everything that you said about certainty, predictability. That's what business clients say to you. That's what business clients say to me. That is what they want from the courts. And if, if complex courts are what we're calling specialty courts, if then um, complex courts are really a, a good and viable um, alternative for business, and, and my uh, business clients seem to appreciate them. That said, at least in California, um, and I expect in other states as well that have complex courts, we don't know how many of those complex divisions will be able to, to keep open. So when we talk about the idea of specialty courts, health courts, as you mentioned, for example, or, or anything along those lines, I have to ask myself, even though it sounds great for, for not only business, but for, for plaintiffs, um, where do we, how do we do that? How do we get to there? What is the way to there with the kind of budget constraints that we have? And maybe that's something we can talk about in, in our solution discussion, either today or tomorrow, but I hope so. And then lastly, ADR. It's, it's a great thing. 90% uh, of the cases, at least on the civil side, should probably settle at some point. But the 10% that need to go to trial should be able to get through the system and be tried uh, civilly. And so ADR is a great, a great tool, but I don't see it as a, uh, a real solution. You know, I, I applaud each one of these ideas, uh, but as you, some panelists said, uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And uh, I've had experience in the specialty courts that have been both good and extremely bad. Uh, I tried a case recently in uh, Florida where they have a business court. Uh, they have one judge in that division because they can't afford other judges. Uh, that judge is notorious for having decisions about a year after you make a uh, try something in front of him or even a motion. You then have that judge telling you that unless you can try the case in three weeks, now, mind you, it's a complex litigation, that he'll declare a mistrial and you have to start over again, okay? So you, in effect, you have to waive a jury trial so that he can take it piecemeal. This is a horrible situation. Uh, you, I had an experience in another Florida court and uh, a complex litigation, which is very positive. So I'm not saying that, uh, that, that it's one way or the other. But I think, unfortunately, we're getting lost a little bit in the weeds uh, and not really talking about the real issue. And the real issue is the underfunding of the courts. And whether you put the, the money into more specialty courts or into more judges or more alternative dispute resolution. In Florida, we, invert, we have um, uh, retired judges, senior judges, who uh, can come in and try cases at $100 a day. But we ran out of money. 
that each would like to put on their financial statement to create something called jobs and new technology uh, resources, but they can't do it because we don't have judges. We don't have courtrooms. We don't have a fully functioning court system. Now, all these ideas have their place, and the more efficient we can be, the better off we are. And, you know, I've heard from people with the, in, the, in the domestic area who believe the collaborative system is impossible. Uh, and they have, they've started talking out against it because they're saying husbands and wives have very different legal rights. And it's all great until somebody realizes that their rights weren't protected. Now, I'm in favor of trying the collaborative approach. But at the end of the day, the real issue and what we have to be talking about is a way of funding the courts. And I know we have a solution part of this agenda, but one thing the dean talked a little bit about is how awkward it is for the courts who will ultimately have to rule on these issues. We are at a litigation point. We are at a tipping point in this whole discussion, and we can discuss that uh, further as the day goes on. But one of the ways we can avoid some of those problems is what they do, and I believe it's Washington now, what uh, Judge Lippman in the New York litigation uh, solution was, and that's it, have a citizen's panel uh, that is uh, constructed to determine what are the needs of the judiciary. So you remove it from the legislative branch, you remove it uh, from the court system, you, you separate it, but you talk about what is really necessary. And then unless the legislature affirmatively vetoes that and the executive affirmatively vetoes that, that becomes the judicial budget of the state. Those are the kind of things that we need to have in place so that business can have a fully functioning court system. We have to remember that today we're in a global uh, economy and we're in a global profession. They don't, businesses, uh, all major businesses, uh, none of them have to uh, be part uh, of the US justice system. They can go uh, to England or, or France or anywhere else they want to do it in different ways than we have if they feel they can get their problems resolved uh, they're not going to come to an environment where the rule of law uh, doesn't exist. And the rule of law begins with one word. It's access. It's no more or less than one word. This whole meeting is about one word. It's access. And without sufficient funding, there's just no access. Well, uh, I, think, I think that puts the problem in perhaps too dark a perspective. I mean, the, uh, yes, uh, you know, the, the, the very serious problem, but I'm not sure it's the only problem, is the case where uh, the courts have done everything they can possibly do to be efficient with the resources that they have, and the legislature still underfunds them to the point where they've got to turn off the lights and fire half their employees. We need to talk about that. There's no question about it. But I also think uh, that part of the problem uh, is in the grayer area where you have courts that, have, uh, that are having shrinking uh, resources, that is shrinking resources from the legislature and need to find ways to use that maximally, that is, as efficiently as possible. And there, there is some room, I think, for discussion. Let me just make one point on that, and then we can go back to yours. Um, in our state, uh, you know, we ran into that problem uh, in connection with uh, the Court of Chancery, was, which is, I think, the, the nation's first specialized business court, although it wasn't created for that, and although it does a lot more than business law. Uh, they needed another judge, but they, all, but they knew that that was going to encounter legislative resistance, and it also threatened the collegiality of the court, because the more judges you have, the harder it is for everybody to talk to each other. The solution they arrived at with and the bargain they made with the legislature uh, was for the existing judges to get one extra law clerk uh, to help them do their caseload and that solved that problem and it was a lot cheaper uh, than adding another judge. One, one last point, excuse me. Uh, we also have, uh, both in the court of law and in the court of equity, masters and commissioners, which are judicial officers but they have a limited jurisdiction. They're not full, what we call Article III judges. They decide cases either of lesser magnitude or they make recommendations which the, the 
judges themselves can either adopt or not and you know, convert into judgments. Those are also budget savers, but they increase the manpower of the court. So that's one thing. But if you're talking about turning off the lights, I, I think uh, the dean said there are really only two recourses that we have, and you know I think there'll be others that are going to talk about it. One is you can litigate, and the other is you've got to find a political solution. Um, we've had some experience with judges litigating over their own salaries, and uh, it's been very unpleasant and very disruptive, and I think that may be in the long run a losing battle. Uh, so my own view, and I hope I will we'll hear from others, is how do you make it politically attractive? Uh, well, what, what you're was talking about. great speaker of the House. I have to <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, it was 20 years ago. That's right. Uh, when Florida, uh, even though we're called the Sunshine State, uh, we're a lot darker than you are in Delaware uh, because only 0.7%, 0 0.7% of 1% goes to our judiciary, number one. And the solution of the legislature was to get rid of the pension funds for the judges and to make them take uh, salary cuts. Uh, we're in a much different environment, I think, uh, Your Honor, than, than you may be. And I think, unfortunately, most states are in the Florida side of that equation. But John, you had to deal with it when you were speaker. Well, I was just going to mention that uh, both of those issues are capacity issues. Either you're reducing capacity or you're trying to find ways to enhance capacity, which responds to the business problem of both certainty and timeliness. So that is a matter of making the case. You know, what is the case for expanding that extra judge? And if you have the business community come to the legislature and say, this we is going it. to help us uh, because judges, it's difficult for judges to lobby mm -hmm. and to deal with the legislature because I, they might be, have a different logic system, perhaps. So uh, the, the ability to say we are doing everything we can, which, which means you're doing things efficiently, and to have a formula and to be able to make the case, and then say we're going to actually improve your economy and save you resources. We're going to use we're going to use dispute resolution, and we're going to use uh, effective courts because business will tell you that makes it faster, more certain, and more effective. So it's bringing those together. It seems to me the ADR thing and the business uh, issue deals with two opposite ends of the spectrum, both of which need help, which is the, the legally less complex, which ought not to be in court, even though it may be emotionally complex. And there might be a right way to do that. And the highly complex legally, which is going to, if you don't have specialty courts, will sap resources that are otherwise doing normal or more regular civil litigation and criminal litigation. So as a strategy combining all these things, but making the case <laughs> that we're here to save you money, mm -hmm. legislature. What <laughs> role do you think the bar plays in this uh, dilemma that the courts find themselves in? Uh, the delay, for example, uh, is that calculated? Is it, um, you know, oftentimes, yes, you have the complaint that the judges don't rule or the judges are lax in their rulings and they're not keeping, you know, the bars, uh, the um, attorney's feet to the fire and, and they're allowing for too many continuances and that's just a clog and a drain on the system. Um, so what is the responsibility of the bar when you're well, I think in a Steve. system? <laughs> like this. Uh, the bar has an absolute responsibility. <laughs> Judges cannot speak for themselves. They are the worst, a matter of fact, it's a, a person you can get out there speaking no, for I themselves. I mean the bar's performance in the courtroom, in the, in the system themselves, not advocating for the, before oh. the legislature because, you know, we understand that role and in, in business and other facets, you know, can come before the legislature and say, you know, this is a story, but actually sometimes, you know, the, um, the trial tactics, the discovery tactics, things like that, get in the way of the efficiencies of the courts. We just changed our oath of office uh, last month in Florida to add civility into the uh, code. We've always it only, had it, only, it only took us problems. a couple hundred years, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, we're 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 right at the at the point of the parade, uh, and I discussed that also at the uh, at the ABA opening assembly. Uh, civility is clearly an issue. 
that uh, in today's world with cable, the cable networks uh, even making it worse than it was before, people saying, uh, you know, we grew up with uh, the statement that I don't agree with what you're saying, but I'll defend to your death your right to say it. Today it's I don't agree with what you're saying, I hate you if you say it, and if you say it, I will raise my voice as loud as I can so you can't be heard. I mean, we have really gone in the opposite direction, lost our way. Unfortunately, some of that has seeped into our profession. We're a very visible profession, uh, and the public uh, assumes that all lawyers act that way, uh, and unfortunately, enough of them do that it gives some credence to that issue, but the abuses in discovery, again, are uh, among the things that we have to fix, but it w if there wasn't a single abuse in discovery, if you don't have a judge to rule on a case, you still have our justice system at risk. And that's why I say that each of these issues are important, are solvable, and we have an obligation to solve them. But without the resources and uh, the political solution that uh, Your Honor talked about, that John talked about, I think it would be a disaster for a judge to file a lawsuit that they're uh, not getting enough money, for example. That's not the issue. The issue is whether the justice system in the state is a functioning justice system. I know in Florida we have, in our Constitution, uh, Article 2 says, for every wrong there has to be a remedy. It's in our Constitution. Well, you can't have a remedy if you don't have a courtroom and a judge to hear your case. Lisa? Well, uh, you know, I agree the problem is underfunding, and you have to address that. But I, I would also say, and, and there are solutions, and the politics is obviously a part of it. I've yeah. spent my entire career in Washington, which I'm proud to say, <laughs> um, where I've been dealing with advocacy. And you have to have a constituency in order to make a, in order to make a case for a solution to a legislature. And I do think the business community can play a very vital role in that. Um, you have to reach out. I don't think it's just the, the bar that plays the role. I think it's the companies themselves and to use your state and local chambers and the U.S. Chamber and other business groups to make them understand, which will play a part in what the impact is, to go to the legislatures and do that lobbying. But that said, I think the other issues that we're discussing um, specialized courts or ADR or do you change venue laws, they're all a part of the puzzle because you're not going to wave a magic wand, right, and fix the problem overnight. So how do you put together a package of measures or promote as the ABA some of these ideas? Um, you certainly discuss them really well in, in the commission's report. Um, you asked Justice O'Connor about the um, role, what role does the bar play in kind of getting rid of some of the problems that we're, mm -hmm. that we're focusing on? And I would tell you, I think, a very real part. Civility is, is obviously a piece of it, but um, a couple of, of examples that I can tell you, when we have moved as the Institute for Legal Reform in states to try to pass some legal reforms or, or get some changes that might make things more efficient, um, we don't necessarily always have the plaintiff's bar opposed to us. A lot of the time we do. But um, the defense bar, uh, and, and I'm sorry if people want to shoot the messenger, that's okay, but the defense bar sits on its hands because that's where you get your business. So we have a hard time oftentimes getting the people who are representing the companies to get out there and push for some of these reforms. And it's the God's honest truth. I've had it happen in many states, or I've seen it happen in many states, and we've had to go back to the companies and say, did you know that your counsel is fighting us on this? <laughs> um, and so it is, I do think there is a responsibility to do that. And then I also think there's a responsibility on the part of the companies not to just sit there and settle every single case. Because if you do, more I find more and more litigation starts to pile up. It's what happened in asbestos, and it's happening in other areas. And so if they feel that they have been wronged or that there's going to continue to be a problem in an area, then they need to try the case and see if they can make some of the problem go away with regard to the, to the litigation. Well, I just think it, huh? what, what, what I'm hearing, what I hope is part of the solution and what I think the report on the ABA's report addresses 
is organized communication and collaboration. And what we really, I think, need to focus on is how do we or really get organized. And I think that means that we have to get outside ourselves as a profession to business, to uh, legislators, to, to, because we've been preaching to the choir for so very long. But also the bar can help with the present problems. First of all, the bar is more than happy to help if any court asks it to. Secondly, um, one thing we started to do in California that seems to be working extremely well, because there are so many of these cases that are not complex, that should be off the docket, mm -hmm. and that are reasonably easy to clear. Uh, we had something that we call the crash program, and we did it by subject areas, employment was one of them, and we had volunteers from the plaintiff and the defense side from all across the community come into the court for a week, and the, all the judges cleared their calendars for a week, and for each lawyer committed to spend one or two days, and each defense lawyer had a plaintiff's lawyer partner, and I'm not sure what the total number of cases that we moved off the docket in that one week was, but I can tell you that it was significant, and in the cases that I was involved with, we settled all of the cases. So I think one way to help is to lessen the load of the court, and the bar can be enlisted to help with that, at least as a temporary measure. You know, we ought to take a moment just for your last word, collaboration. Whenever, uh, last year I didn't build this right now, goes to a defense bar association, the first thing they'll tell you is the ABA is run by plaintiff's lawyers. When you go to the plaintiff's bar, they'll tell you it's run by defense lawyers. Uh, it, it never fails, I promise you. But when have we ever had a collaboration that existed between the ABA, the Federalist Society, ABODA, the Conference of Chief Justices, the American Chamber? We're all saying the same thing if we really believe it. Why can't we collaborate in a way that makes a statement that this is a societal problem that goes to the very heart of our, uh, of our justice system. You know, when you mentioned Sandra Day O'Connor, I think she has the best quote of anybody who's ever dealt with any of these issues. And she says that in, in every society, there has to be a safe place. And in a democracy, that safe place must be the court system. There's nothing better that can summarize everything we're talking about. And that safe place we've all determined by sitting up here and by coming to this conference is in jeopardy. So how do we collaborate, going to your question, as bar associations and bar leaders in different organizations, to make this a statement that this is a universal problem and it's not, you know, the rich against the poor, the big against the small, whatever, any kind of divisions that people want to put in play. How do we do that? That's a... a Good, good way to uh, end our portion of the discussion and, and maybe open it up to some questions from the audience that uh, can generate some additional discussion. Um, I think that uh, what I'm hearing from our conversation here is that it's a multifaceted problem, obviously, that uh, there is a, a, a push, an initiative that must be a collaborative effort in order to um, uh, preserve uh, the integrity of the court system and the access of its citizens to the court system, but there's also a responsibility of the courts to demonstrate efficiencies and demonstrate that they have the innovation and the foresight and the vision and the integrity in the industry to do what they can to be good stewards of the monies that are allocated and, and to provide the service. Uh, and if that if those two initiatives come together, I think we will serve uh, the business climate as well as the, um, you know, the average citizen that comes to the court for, you know, your slip and fall or, or whatever else they're trying to access the courts uh, in order to resolve. Uh, it's going to take a collaboration again from the courts and the bar association, the legislatures, uh, but uh, I'm optimistic that it can be done. I'm not, I'm not very pessimistic and I, I don't like to use the word dark when we're talking about the situation <laughs> because uh, I think that there, there are ways, uh, we're, we're, um, we're in a good place to affect a good, good solution here. So I would like to open uh, the discussion further to the folks that are sitting out there. And I remind you there are microphones available. 
But don't all rush. <laughs> we couldn't have done that good a job. Yeah, really. <laughs> we didn't cover the waterfront here. All right, Bill Weisenberg. My question is to John Mills. And, and, and let me just say, a couple of weeks ago I called you and I asked you a question. And he's waiting for a call. You remember this. The question was pretty simple. When you were Speaker of the House, on how many occasions did a group of constituents ever come to talk with you about court funding? Zero. Never. Zero. Okay. No. The question is, let's fast forward now 20 years, and you're Speaker of the House today. Because we're talking about collaboration, and let's be honest, we're talking about lobbying. If I were going to call, if I set a meeting up with you, who would you want me to bring to talk with you? And who would influence you and make a difference with regard to, fun, to this issue? That's a good question. I'm, your, I'm the lobbyist. Who would you suggest I bring with me, beside the two people, beside Lisa from the chamber and Aboda? Who else, would, who else should I have with me there? Because it's, isn't it, doesn't it come down to who the constituency is and who comes to visit with you and, the, and, the, and, uh, and who they represent? Sure, you'd want to have um, corporate representatives, civic group representatives, people that could explain something out, even outside of their direct interest, that they have a community interest, and, and judges. But when you and I had this conversation before, we also said the, in, the average individual legislator knows that there are 20 judges in his district and there are 50,000 parents <laughs> and school teachers. And the judges don't lobby that much and can't. But I mean, Bill's, uh, and one of the things Bill is doing uh, for the task force this year that is continuing Steve's work is to figure out how we do that. I mean, it's a communication issue and a lobbying issue, but in, uh, particularly also in response to what you said that the, uh, you have to show you're efficient if you're gonna ask for something. Um, one of the first questions should be, what have you done? Right. How to make a good system even better is always, you know, a, a theme mm -hmm. that I uh, that I discuss. I, I find it, uh, you know, maybe I'm naive on this, but I'm, I find it disconcerting that you've got to come and 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 plead a case with lobbyists. No offense, Bill, but but uh, <laughs> to get, uh, you know, to get this issue uh, uh, resolved and to to identify and have a legislature realize the importance of the third branch of government is a pretty sad commentary on the legislative conscience if, and, and, and psyche if they don't realize that the third branch of government is every bit as equal and powerful and essential to our society. Um, I think maybe the fault lies with the quality of the legislator if they're not going to recognize that that is, you know, inherent in, in our checks and balances system is just so, um, you know, it, that's hard. But, but you always have to make your case. You always have to uh, identify what you've done to help yourself to improve your institution. And if you can do that, um, the, the uh, you know, the, the results should be there. Oh, no, I don't normally impugn the intelligence of legislators. Uh, <laughs> they're, I'm not talking about their intelligence. I'm just talking about maybe well, their perspective. <laughs> their, perspective. <laughs> their knowledge and skill level of the United States Constitution and their own. Uh, well, uh, I, I think you have to say there are examples of the legislature constantly and referring to the, uh, the judiciary as an agency and not understanding it's a separate branch, or not treating it as a separate branch, and even doing cutbacks uh, that are uh, saying, well, we'll just do a proportional cutback to all the agencies. Right. And that's, uh, uh, so there is an education issue. There is an issue of um, judges inviting legislators into their courtrooms mm -hmm. and uh, just elevating the level of, uh, of the conversation because uh, I, I don't think you can assume. You know, the ABA has the ABA Day on the Hill, right. which we do every year. We bring about 500 lawyers to Washington. We, do, we have three uh, of all our resolutions. We designate three as the ones we're going to focus on because that's all you can do at any one time. And we meet with the individual legislators, both uh, the leadership, the House, the Senate, and we've had some pretty good success. 
Legal Services Corporation, as poorly funded as it is, wouldn't exist today mm -hmm. at all if it wasn't for those ABA days. There was a $125 million cut that was proposed. We limited it to $17 million. Not, not what we wanted, but still not $125 million. We need to do that state by state. And we have a national, what's called, at least in the, uh, there's an organization called National Conference of Bar Presidents that meets at the same time as the ABA. Um, they have resources to go to their state legislatures. I mean, what Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. Uh, and I think a lot of people said it before him. Uh, so going back to Bill's question, we've got to get people who are on their election committee, who are on their campaign, you know, who they've gone to time and again to uh, be elected, who they have, the, they, 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 they're supposed to have some interest in, in what they think. So I do think that we need to be better organized to go back to your honor, you know, what the bar can do. I think we can do more. I, I see part of the problem, not the whole problem, but a, a significant part of it is that the average citizen does not know the importance of the courts in our society. Um, they are ill-informed in their education about the three branches of government and the checks and balances. And then when you think about kids today, youth, and how they're exposed to the courts, it's, they get their information from television. And I say this more than once, that they come home from school, they turn on the television, and those ridiculous judge shows are on in the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> and they think that judges are, you know, snippy, disrespectful, ugly people, and so why do they want to have a, a judge, you know, the courts preserved? You go down to the the evening shows True. and judges are portrayed as curmudgeons, buffoons, incompetence, corrupt, and lawyers don't fare much better in the evening shows either. I always say that, you know, there's no Atticus Finches around, uh, you know, in uh, evening TV in the American uh, um, entertainment world. Uh, so we need to do a better job as lawyers and judges and go into the communities and the schools and really reteach or, or teach for the first time an emphasis on the importance of the judiciary and how we are protectors of your rights. Every right that you get from the Constitution, every right that you think you have, and you know, that's the first thing you hear out of people, I have a right to do this. Well, you know, how do you know? You know, and, and it's part of, of our responsibility as judges and, and lawyers to fill that void. There's plenty of great models, great educational uh, programs that have been developed by bar associations and uh, that are just fabulous opportunities. They do it, but not to the extent I think that it is necessary. Uh, a little commercial for the ABA. Our civics commission this year that, that Sandra Day O'Connor mm -hmm. is actually the uh, person most responsible for and very active with it, uh, has online today. Any one of you who want to go online to the ABA and get civic plans to go into any high school or junior high school and teach a civics course if you'd like to. Uh, Justice uh, O'Connor and Justice uh, Souter and Justice uh, Breyer have particularly been speaking out about this. Justice, uh, the, the latest poll says that uh, uh, two out of every three high school graduates say the three branches of government are Democrat, Republican, and Independent. Oh, that's that's, sad. That, that's the last poll. Oh, that's really bad. And uh, it's, it's, it's very scary. 75% uh, of all Americans don't know that the First Amendment protects religious freedom. And Newsweek, about three months ago, I don't know if you recall, had a cover sheet said, "Why is their, their cover said, why is America failing civics? And that uh, they quoted that uh, more Americans can name one judge on American Idol than any judge on the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, it, it's just a parade of horribles. And what happened is, about 20 years ago, when we started focusing on teaching science and math. We stopped te testing on civics. So civics is now a, uh, is, is not mandatory in many if not most high schools in the, in the United States. So you can graduate uh, from a high school in the United States never having had a single day of civics. And uh, the Florida Bar, for example, the NCBP, uh, National Conference of Bar Presidents, asked every state to go to the legislature and make civics mandatory in their high schools. The Florida Bar did that and got the legislature actually to pass that. So, I mean, there are things we can do. A lot of people think one of the best things we could do is go have a civics course for our legislature. Um, matter of fact, it's maybe one reason that the recent poll shows that only 15% of Americans had any respect for their congressmen 
and women. It's the lowest it's ever been since it's been recorded in history. And part of it has to do with this failure to understand the respective roles of government. Any other questions from the audience? Sir? I'm Martin Brinkley. I'm the president of the North Carolina Bar Association. And one of the reasons that I came to this conference was to gain what I hope will be some practical suggestions about how we invest the business community with interest in our court system. And so I'm here because I'll direct that to Lisa. But I would love to have four or five practical suggestions about how you interest the business community in this problem and sustain that interest over a period of time such that it can actually affect funding decisions in the legislature. Thank you for the question. In case uh, everyone didn't hear that, uh, his, uh, his request is that we can identify some motivating factors for the business community to become engaged in this issue of funding for the courts uh, and, and uh, um, the importance of the courts, why they should be involved and uh, how to get them involved. Well, I think the important part here is that they need to be asked in a manner, you know, who, who are general counsels of corporation, corporations going to be most responsive to? Well, they're going to be most responsive to the judiciary. If, if the ask is made, if people are uh, brought in, if you go to certain uh, conferences, there are many different groups of general counsels, the American Corporate Council, and I mean, there's, there's three or four different ones. And if there's discussion held there and there's outreach directly from, uh, from the judiciary to them, asking them to engage and making the case, um, I do think, but I, I look, everybody, they have a lot on their plate. I think you can't ask for a solution or ask people to do things, I think, of both the legislature and the business community without good arguments and without a plan to say, this is how we're fix it. We're not going to just pour money in and, you know, turn on more lights in some different courthouses. We actually, in this state, have a plan where we're going to create a more efficient court system. And so I think there is some responsibility on, uh, you know, on both sides, that there has to be an argument made to bring them in that where there really is going to make a difference if we get full funding. I, just, I agree with that. Just Donna? one thought. I mean, one good starting place for them to become involved is with the General Counsel Committee of the National Center for State Courts, mm -hmm. which is a really great opportunity for them to become involved with right the idea. Chief Justices and to become involved with discussions about this issue. In fact, I can't think of a better place. Um, so hopefully you'll mention that to them if you have the opportunity. I think another um, avenue for contact with the business community and uh, allowing them to be really on the ground floor of fashioning solutions and, and maybe uh, messages with that, with, about this problem is for the Supreme Court to create these task, force, uh, task forces on uh, court funding and, and uh, you know, problems in court funding, alternatives to court funding, whatever you want to call it, and make sure that your task force is bipartisan, that it, all the stakeholders are represented, and that you ask the business community to give you volunteers to be on these committees that are people that are willing to attend the meetings, to be creative, to be thoughtful, and then we'll make good messengers back to their constituents. And, and uh, you know, you bring them down to the Supreme Court, and that's where you hold your meetings. And the right Chief Justice is there starting the meetings off and, and interacting. And it, it, it's a very effective way to uh, interact with the stakeholders on any topic, not just funding, but um, we, have, we have quite a few commissions and task force and, and advisory committees uh, in Ohio, um, and they're invaluable to giving us uh, advice and, and productivity and solutions and, uh, and become ambassadors for the message. It's, it's a great way of doing it. In, uh, in support of that, there are a series of, uh, of ideas that are actually in this task force report that 
Steve appointed, and it was that task force was appointed in a very bipartisan way. I guess uh, it had been mentioned that uh, David Boys and Ted Olson were the two chairmen, uh, and there are a series of ideas about collaboration. There's also one I wanted to mention on schools. That in New Hampshire, I talked to a public school teacher who held what she called law school in fourth grade. And they loved it, and part of their job was to explain the Constitution to their parents. And they had to certify that they had done that. So that's a way to have a multiplier effect <laughs> on, uh, on kids. And there are a series of those ideas in the report as well. Great. I think we're over our time, if I'm reading your watch upside down correctly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's some other questions. Are, are there any other questions? I don't mean to cut anybody off. Okay, well, I want to thank my uh, panel members and... Uh...